Well, three times a month, Jermaine Washington and Michelle Stevens would get together for what they would call a gratitude lunch. And with good reason, uh, Washington uh, donated a kidney to Stevens, who he describes as really just a friend. And they met at work, and they were used to having lunch together. And one, da- one day, Michelle, there was something wrong in her heart, and, and he could tell, and she began to actually weep in front of him as she spoke about waiting for a kidney donor for 11 months. She was being sustained by uh, dialysis. She was suffering chronic fatigue and blackouts and was plagued by joint pain. Well, Because Washington couldn't stand the thought of her suffering and even the thought of her possibly dying, he gave her one of his kidneys. When you've got something great to be thankful for, having a gratitude lunch is a great way to celebrate. And today, we will be having what we could call today a gratitude supper, the Lord's Supper. A great way to celebrate Jesus' victory over death and sin, and it is certainly something great to be thankful for. It's a day of remembrance, and it is what brings us to our passage in Numbers chapter 10 today. So turn to Numbers. Yes, you heard me right. Numbers chapter 10. And we'll continue our communion study. And we'll see how this even connects to our Lord's Supper, especially our first point today in remembering the past victories. And we won't be reading, we'll go over chapters 10 and 11, but we won't be reading all the verses, but many of the verses today, as they have great relevance. Starting in verse 1, Numbers chapter 10. It says this, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver, silver trumpets of hammered work. You shall make them. You shall use them for summoning the congregation for breaking camp. When both are blown, all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. But if only if they blow only one, and then the chiefs and the heads of the tribes of Israel shall gather to them, themselves to you. When you, you blow an alarm, the camps that, are, camps that are on the east side shall set out. And when you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that are on the south side shall set out. And alarm to be blown whenever they are to set out. But when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow a long blast, and you shall not sound an alarm. The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpets. The trumpets shall be to you for a perpetual statue throughout your generations. And when you go to war in your land against the adversary who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets. that You may be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies on the day of your gladness also at the appointed feasts. In the beginnings of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices over of your peace offerings, and they shall be a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord, your God. So, God told Moses to make two trumpets. And these trumpets actually had incredible significance for the people of Israel and incredible significance for us today. If this was an infomercial about these two trumpets, you would hear this often. But wait, there's more. And the face of the infomercial is the uh, sons of Aaron. And only the priests uh, could blow the trumpets. That was the only one that could do that. And they had to be good at it. They had to be good at blowing these trumpets because how they would blow them would signify a certain alarm for people to start moving. Whether it was just the leaders, we'll go over this together, or the people of Israel, or certain things were happening in camp, based on how they would blow that trumpet was the significance. So for us to remember, I'm very, for me, I'm very visual, I like to have word pictures, so I'm going to give you some word pictures today for us to allow it to understand what the trumpets mean, meant back then, and maybe what they could mean for us today. The first thing is, you heard this Uh, word actually over and over and it is alarm and so a word picture I wanted to present to you was alarm clock Uh, these trumpets actually acted as an alarm that set off uh, for the Israelites to move their camp 
See, we know that they had the pillar over them to lead them from one camp to another, but there was also a trumpet that would sound to say, okay, it's time to pack up again, and it's time to move camp. Second, some of you don't like to see this, okay, I understand. It's a Zoom invitation. You see, <laughs> have seen many of these, especially in the last couple years, uh, to invite you to a meeting. And that's what these two trumpets would often do. This, they would signify that a meeting needed to happen. So it was like their Zoom invitation of Numbers chapter 10, and everyone needed to come together if the two trumpets sounded. If just a certain trumpet sounded, then that means just the leaders could come. So if you liken it to the office, um, maybe there's just the administration. The Zoom invitation for those that are in administration can come together. And then there's those Zoom invitations for everyone in the office to come together and have a Zoom meeting. That's sort of like what the trumpets were doing. And then third, it is to set a reminder. If you have an important meeting, a child special event, or you have to take certain medication at a certain time, you're going to set a reminder likely on your phone or on your device. And these trumpets not only signified important meetings that were happening, but they also provided a reminder of both the past and the future. See, first the past. The trumpets sounded to remind the people of an upcoming festival. As we learned in our last numbers study a couple months ago, these festivals were reminders of what God had done. Whether it was Passover or other feasts that they uh, would participate in, it was a remembrance of God's faithfulness, and it's something we certainly would be doing today. As we get together for the Lord's Supper, we are remembering God's faithfulness to us. But it was also a signification or a reminder of the future. See, the people of Israel at this time were looking forward into the future of a land that was promised to them. Yes, that's where we get the name, the promised land, the land of Canaan. But here's the issue. That was in enemy territory. I think we just sometimes think they were uh, given the promised land and maybe the flannel graphs of Sunday school allow us to just think they walked right in there and they got the land of Canaan. I think it was something like 31 battles that they had to face to go through enemy territory, really go through wars to get to the promised land. It was going to take battles to get there. So this trumpet became significant in the battles, one after another after another, to remember that God was the one that was leading them into battle. God was the one that was leading them into the promised land. This was my promise to you, people of Israel, God was saying to them. This was a battle cry. This was God saying that I'm going to bring you victory. I'm sure the soldiers were, I don't know if we can even call them soldiers, we'll go over that in a second, but the people of Israel, as they were going into battle, as they were facing the enemies, I'm sure as they heard that trumpet, it sounded to them like victory. It's like if your alma mater song, or as they play certain songs in sporting events, it gets those athletes pumped up for what's going to happen. And that's what that trumpet was doing. It's saying, listen, we're going to have victory today. Get them fired up. It gave them confidence for the fight that was about to happen. So the first battle, when they heard that trumpet, okay, the Lord is with us. We're... What about the 15th battle? What about the 31st battle? I bet when they heard it for the 31st time, they knew that God was going to bring them victory even more so. It's a reminder of who the Lord is. And any war or any battle that the Lord leads you in, He will bring you victory. If God is leading you into something, if you are following God's will in your life, He's going to bring victory. And these two, these two trumpets, as I thought of this, how this would interact within camp, it's one of those moments as you're studying and then you kind of look up and say, I wonder how this really happened. Because these priests had to be pretty good at what they did. They had to make sure that they would blow the trumpet in the right way, the short blow or the long blow or a certain note. So how did they practice? I'm just curious. I mean, 
Oh, did you hear that? Are, are, we, are we going to war? Oh, sorry, guys. I was just, I was just practicing. You can, go, you can go back to your tents now. Uh, oh, off in the distance, you hear a trumpet blow. So 600,000 Israelites come into camp. And the priest is like, oh, um, I was just practicing in my E flat. You guys can go all the way back to your camps now. I'm not sure how that happened, but maybe it's me that just thinks that way. But the point is this. These trumpets were significant. The, the priests had an important job, and each note that they would blow into that trumpet would signify something. It was an alarm of something vital that was happening from the Lord speaking to them. And I want to say this, that I believe that we can apply these trumpets to 2022. So I'm going to go back to those three word pictures, if we could, and apply those to our own lives and how uh, really the significance was to Israel can be significant to us as well. The first is the alarm clock, which I believe is the worst sound in all of nature. <laughs> but do you allow God's voice and scripture and Holy Spirit and your heart to move you? Are you, are you even listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in your life? Are you just pressing snooze? It could be that you are too busy. It could be that your life is too loud. It could be that you are simply too far away from holiness to even hear the trumpet sound in your life. Might I encourage you today to listen to the alarms that God has placed in your life, whether it's the Holy Spirit, whether it's God's Word, whether it's the wisdom from those godly people that are around you. Listen. Listen. And then secondly would be a Zoom invitation. This may be a little bit of a stretch, but I liken it to the invitation to gather because that's basically what the trumpet would do very often. The trumpet would blow and the people of Israel would come together. And you are here now, those that are looking at my face right now, you are here now, you answered the call again to come to church on Sunday. But there's other things that you could come to do and gather. There's, there's small group, I realize we're taking a break for summer soon, but there's other things like prayer nights or other opportunities throughout the summer and throughout the year to gather together, serve alongside each other, and worship the Lord together. Third would be to set a reminder. A reminder that God will be with you and will bring you victory in your battles. There was a, a year in my family where we suffered through just incredible difficulty. It seemed like one thing after another. This was a while ago, but it was one of the hardest years of our lives. And, um, but God was so faithful. And so because of that faithfulness that God um, was to us that year, and every year after, of course, but specifically that year, uh, we gave uh, the child that, that God gave us the following year, we gave her middle name Faith for a reason. Because it will now act as a reminder to us every time we say her name, say her middle name, it's a reminder, it's a marker in our lives, in our hearts, of the faithfulness of God throughout that year. It's like, it's like Uncle Billy and It's a Wonderful Life and all the strings that are attached to his fingers to remind you of God's faithfulness over and over again. You need to have markers in your life to remind you of God's faithfulness and how he brought you through such battles in your life, such difficulty, such trials. And you can look at it and say, I remember that. I remember that God brought me through that. And I want to remind myself of that, whether it's something you, a, a magnet on your fridge or, or a phrase that you write on your uh, bedroom mirror, whatever it is, something to remind you. I would encourage you to do that. Remind yourself of the past faithfulness of God, which, of course, reminds us of the future promises that he gives us, which brings us to our next part of our passage, remembering the future promises of God. So chapter 10, this is kind of the section of 11 through 36, and uh, as Numbers often does, you might notice this, it gives these summary verses of all the things that it said before. So we're actually going to start in the summary verse in verse 28. This is section is 11 through 36, but we're going to read 28 through 36. 
It says this, this in verse 28. This was the order of march of the people of Israel by their companies when they set out. And Moses said to Hobab, the son of Reuel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will do good to you, for the Lord has promised good to Israel. But he said to him, I will not go. I will not depart my own land and to my kindred. And he said, Please do not leave us, for you know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you will serve as eyes for us. And if you do go with us, whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same will he do to you. So they set out from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them three days' journey to seek out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day whenever they set out from the camp. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. So, what do we know about the trumpets, okay? When they moved camp, there was obviously someone blowing a trumpet somewhere, okay? And they began to move camp again. And in the next several verses from really 10 to 27, we see, uh, 11 to 27, we see them begin to move one tribe after another, and it's all summed up there in verse 28. After that, as they began to move, we see a little a personal interaction between Moses and his family. And Moses is talking to his uh, brother-in-law, I believe, Hobab, to come with the people of Israel and, and move on to the next step, to, to move on to the next destination in their pursuit of the promised land. Well, Hobab didn't want to go. He's like, this, this is where I'm comfortable. This is my land. I, I know this place. I've set my roots here. This is where I want to be. And so Moses begins to try to convince Hobab to come on the trip. Come on, come with us. You could be the eyes of the trip. You could kind of navigate for us through the land. And, and you're more familiar with this place. So Moses tried to convince him to go with him. Not only to provide something for him to do, but he was also saying, listen, this is the best thing for you. This, the, the, in front of you, if you follow with us, there is good that the Lord has promised us. It reminds me of a story that I recently read of a, a night an elderly, elderly couple uh, entered the lobby of a hotel. And uh, it was a very busy time of the year. And uh, they asked for a room, and the clerk uh, said that they were filled. And as, as really all the hotels were at that time, and, and, uh, the, but the clerk said this, I can't seem uh, send a fine couple like you out in the rain, he said. Would you be willing to, to sleep in my quarters? And the couple hesita hesitated, but the, the clerk insisted and the next morning when the man came to pay his bill, he said this, you're the kind of man who should be managing the best hotel in the United States, and, and someday I'll build you one. And the clerk smiled politely to him, maybe thinking he's a little crazy. But a few years later, that same clerk received a letter from the elderly man recalling that stormy night and asking him to come to New York. A round-trip ticket was enclosed, and when the clerk arrived, his host took him to the corner of 5th Avenue and 34th Street, where stood a magnificent new building. That, explained the same man, is the hotel that I have built for you to manage. And that man's name was William Waldorf Astor, and the hotel was the original Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And that young clerk, George Bolt, became its first manager. Now imagine, imagine if that manager just stayed where he was. Imagine if that manager did not take that ticket, did not go to New York City. Imagine if he just stayed where he was comfortable. He would have missed out on an incredible opportunity. So let me ask you this. Does this happen in your life? where you would rather live in your own comfort than follow God's call on your life. See, God's blessings and, and the promised land were, were ahead of the Israelites. 
They had to move forward. They couldn't just remain. They had to continue following the Lord. And church, it's easy to be tempted to remain in comfort. To do things as we've always done them. But there are times when God calls us as a church, as a follower of God, to step out of your comfort zone and to move forward. This is going to be difficult to hear, but I'm going to say it anyway. Some of you will never find the full riches of God's blessings because you are never willing to take a step of faith. What if you never took a bite of cake? What if you never got on that airplane? What if you never took that job application and filled it out? See, life is full of choices. And choices that determine the blessings that are waiting for you to experience in the future. And spiritually speaking, if you never take the steps of faith in gospel conversations and spiritual and service opportunities and God-led moments, then you will miss out on the fruit of the blessings that God has planned for you in the future. So what choice does Hobab have? Is he going to remain in the life of comfort? Is he going to just stay there and not enjoy the blessings that are in the promised land? Well, our passage does not tell us, but there's more in the Bible, so that's good. So if you kept turning to Judges, I'll just read it for you. But Judges chapter 1, verse 16 tells us the end of, of Hobab's journey, what he decided. And it says this, And the descendants of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near Arad. And they went and they settled with the people. Way to go, Hobab. You made the right decision. You went with the people of God. It seems like he changed his mind. He wasn't named there, so we can't definitively say, but it does say the in-laws family did go with the people of God. Something I never thought of, but as theologian Ronald Allen points out, he said, Hobab must have been an invaluable aid to Moses. Because, as we know, those, that few weeks journey that they thought they were on ended up lasting a lifetime. So you never know. You never know what blessings you will receive from the Lord, but you also never know what type of blessing that you will be for others if you follow God's will in your life. And that's what Hobab must have been for Moses. He became his navigator. He became his eyes for the land. And let me say this too, as we have a vision as, uh, for the year of redemptive relationships, we are to be the Moses to everyone around us, to sharing God's promises to those that are around us, to, to what could be in someone's future, to someone that may not be a believer, to say, listen, this is what God has promised us if you follow him. This is the good, as Moses put it, this is the good that is in front of you. And I want to share this with you. A future of blessing. And Moses wanted to make sure that Hobab did not miss out on that. And then Moses then concludes in chapter 10, really with a declaration of protection and presence of the Lord through it all. Enemies really are of no consequence. It doesn't matter. The Israelites will prevail because the Lord is on our side. So whatever you are facing today, may God provide that protection and presence so clearly to you as well. And then moving on to chapter 11. So chapter 10, it seems like the Israelites were following well. They were moving camp. They were doing things right. And then chapter 11 happens. The chain reaction of forgetfulness. We're going to be bouncing around here in chapter 11, but a few uh, verses 1 and 2 and then 4 and 6 as we start here. Chapter 11, verse 1. And the people complained in the heart hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes, and when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned against them and consumed some 
outlying parts of the camp. And when the people cried out to Moses and, and Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire died down. Verse 4. So now the rabble uh, that was among them had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept, wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. They didn't know that was going to rhyme in English, but they, anyways. We remember the, the fish we ate in G Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. First of all, I want to talk to you all about complaining. Don't ever think that complaining is a small sin. Just look at God's reaction to the complaining of the Israelites. His anger was kindled, which means it was burning, it was growing warm, it was on fire. How do I know that? Well, I looked up what the word meant, first of all, but also as we see in verse 1 and verse 2, it's described as fire. God was hot with anger because of their complaining. Have you ever thought that your complaining about something could do that to the Lord? Because here's what you're essentially saying when you are complaining. What God has given me is not good enough. Well, when you put it that way, you could see how God might get angry. But here's the thing about complaining. It's an addictive habit. Once it starts, it is so easy for you to see the negative. It will become a mindset for everything in your life. You will always see the negative. negative. Before you even know it, you're complaining about everything. This is a little confession time right in front of you all. But I remember several years ago, I still remember, I was, um, we were on a, just, I don't know where we were traveling as a family in, in the van, but from the seats behind me, I could hear some complaining. And I said to my wife, where do they get that complaining from? And of course, thinking, being the optimist of the pair, it couldn't be me. And my wife so gently responded, where do you think? <laughs> you know, if that slice of humble pie had some Cool Whip on it, it would have tasted a lot better. Now, this was a while ago. But I, as I was thinking that through, I didn't answer her right away. But as I was thinking that through, I kind of took that to heart. And the next few days, even the next few minutes and hours, I was catching myself complaining at the silliest things. So I encourage you to try it out today, to notice how much you complain about the silliest things in life, how often you look at the times that, are, that, that you turn things negative, that you... Ignore the goodness of God in your life that we just sang about. We sang about it at 11 o'clock, and then at 1 o'clock, you're forgetting about the goodness of God, and I'm pointing at myself too. You're going to wish you had some Cool Whip for your humble pie when you get that as well. So what is the proper reaction to complaining? Moses provides it for us, and put an F on my paper for this as well. I mean, how many times do we react to complaining this way? What did Moses do? When Moses heard the complaining, Moses prayed. So when you hear the complaining, maybe it is a sign for you to pray. Pray for yourself, because it may be you that is doing the complaining. Pray for others. And pray for the situation. But it's not the most remarkable reaction that we see to the complaining. It's God's reaction. Because God had mercy. God responded with mercy. The Israelites were becoming pros at complaining. But this was, seemed to be the straw that broke the camel's back. This was seeming the, seemingly the last straw on how God reacted. He was so angry with the people of Israel. 
And when Moses prayed to God, it actually says that the, the fire died down with God. That's mercy. A testament that prayer does work in any situation, even in our complaining. And then, what were they complaining about? I call this the complaint department. Apparently, back in the day, in the PR departments of the 70s, there was an actual department called the complaint department. I don't think they have those anymore in businesses. I don't think anyone wanted to work there anymore. But anyways, what, what were the people of Israel complaining about? They were complaining about the menu. They were being served an all-carbs meal, and they wanted some protein in their diet. They wanted meat. It gets worse. First of all, they wept over this, over meat. Now, the first time I have had ribs, I may have wept myself. <laughs> but they are weeping because they don't have meat. It's like a toddler at the dinner table complaining that it's not hot dogs and mac and cheese. And listen to this. They wept so loudly, it says in verse 10, that Moses would actually go out of his tent and he would hear them crying about meat. It gets worse. They begin to reminisce and wishing for the fish that they had in Egypt. And are you ready for this? Did you catch it? They said that cost nothing <laughs> that costs nothing how soon we forget the truth when we complain cost nothing how about your freedom how about your your dignity how about your way of life people of israel you've forgotten it gets worse okay maybe not as worse as that that was pretty bad but it keeps going they complained, and, and look at that phrase, nothing at all but this manna to look at. Nothing at all but this manna to look at. First of all, it says in verse 8 that manna can make cakes, and who doesn't like cakes? I don't know why they were complaining. But what happens, but that happens to be God's provision for them in their life. They, could have, they were in the desert, the wilderness. They could have easily starved. But day after day, without fail, the Lord provided food from the heavens that literally fell in their laps so that they wouldn't starve to death. How often do we complain about the very thing that is God's grace in our lives? The very thing that is God's provision we complain about it. Whether you complain about the spouse or your children or your apartment or your car or your job. Sure, there are difficulties in life, but how quickly do we complain about the very pictures in our lives of God's grace and provision and love and blessings and care for us from above? Plain is a hard one, but it's a good lesson to learn. And then there's this short kind of aside in this uh, Numbers chapter 11. We kind of were talking about complaining, and then we kind of just take a little aside here in verses 10 through 17. Moses has a, a conversation with God, and it does have a little bit to do with the complaining. He's struggling here. Verse 10. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. And Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have, you found favor in your, why have I not found favor in your sight that you laid the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, Carry them in your bo bosom, and nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they weep before me and say, Give me meat that we may eat. I may not be able to carry all these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may 
not see my wretchedness. And then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of the meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. They shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you may not bear it yourself alone. So Moses had enough. He's like, why are these people my problem? Why do, I have to, why do I have to deal with this any I can't do this. I can't carry this burden any longer. They're weeping about meat, God, outside of their tents. This is, this is too much. In God's solution, I, it must have been just a calming voice. That's how I just envision it. Listen, Moses, I'm going to get 70 men out of the elders of Israel, and they're going to share your burden for you. And the men came and shared that burden of Moses just like our church has, um, that you have chosen, that you have voted for as our deacons that are willing to serve you today in our Lord's Supper. They help share my and, and Pastor Jacob's burden, the church's burden. And I'm thankful for the deacons that are willing, willingly meet, likely to not tonight, for several hours of the Lord's business. They make visits, they help counsel, they make telephone calls and contact their care groups each month. They lead ministries, and the list goes on. And there is no way that I could be able to stand today without those eight men sharing the burden, although in this case, a wonderful burden in leading and shepherding our church. And I'm thankful for them. But in terms of your personal burden, as you try to apply what Moses is going what, going, what is going on in his life to your own. It's not often something we share. If you would say that you're, you don't typically or likely share all your burdens with others. And some of you all are tired. Some of you all are anxious, worried, or struggling. Well, look around. There are people in this room that care about you. And that want to share that burden. That want to hear what is going on in your life. That want to pray with you and for you. We're not to carry our burdens alone. So how are we to do this? Just a couple things and we'll move on to our final point. First is simply pray. Matthew chapter 11 verses 29 through 30. Jesus tells us to share our burdens. To, to rest our souls and lighten our burdens as we give it to him. Pray. That's the first thing you need to do with your burdens. And then second, there's a church community right here. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, commands us not to neglect meeting, but to encourage one another. The church is designed for burden sharing. Whether it's praying together, whether it's joining a small group where burdens are shared, whether it's being part of ministries and serving together, whether it's just... The plain fact that we are God's people together with a common goal. And that we're brothers and sisters willing to share burdens together. So if you want to lighten your burdens, pray and commit to church. That will lighten your burden. And then finally, be careful what you ask for and more careful how you ask for it. I don't know if you have ever told your students or your children or grandchildren this lesson, but it's an important one. And in chapter 11, verses 18 through 20, we'll start there. And say to your people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord saying, who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. I'm pause there. God heard that. He heard you say that. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. And you shall not eat just one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils. 
Yeah, a little sense of humor from the Lord there. And becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before Him, saying, Why did we come out of Egypt? Now, he repeated something twice there. We're going to get to that. Go into verse 31. Then a wind from the Lord sprang up, and it brought quail from the sea and let them fall beside the camp about a day's journey on the si this side and a day's journey on the other side. That's a lot of quail around the camp and about two cubits above the ground. And the people rose all that day and all night and all the next day and gathered the quail. Those who gathered at least gathered ten homers, and then they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. While the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. So two lessons here. Be careful what you ask for, and more careful how you ask for it. So water, and ice cream, and screen time on your device. Those could be good things, but too much of a good thing can be bad for you. Do you know that too much water can be harmful to your kidneys? Do you know that too much ice cream can be bad for your cholesterol? I don't know about that one. <laughs> Too much screen time can be bad for your sleep and your eyes and your neck. Too much of a good thing. So God was like, you want meat? Fine. I'm just not going to give you meat for a day or a week. I'm going to give it for you for a whole month. You're going to get meat sweats and you are going to have meat coming out your nostrils. And there are times when I believe that God does this to us. To teach us a lesson. You want to be in that relationship? Fine. Go ahead. We'll see how that ends up. You want to spend all that money on that car or that house way beyond the provision that I've given you? Fine. Go do it. We'll see how that goes. I think our prayer lives can be this way. When we, when we pray for something we think we need... God has much better plans, but we push it. God's like, fine, have all the quail you want. Have it two cubits deep. Take it. If that's what you want, if you keep praying, if you think you need it and you're not listening to me and you're not listening to the godly wisdom around you, you're not in prayer about this and you don't want my will, you don't want my advice, you don't want my wisdom, take all the quail. Fine. Because we overlook the manna that is in our lives because we keep asking for meat. And in doing so, it changes the outlook we have on life. See, when we don't get what we think we need, we get sad, we get discontent, and we complain. How do I know that? It's right here. And it's probably right here in your own life. When you see that you are asking for things and wanting, I should say, wanting things that are not in God's will, you begin to complain about it. You begin to be sad about it. You begin to be irritable about it. The Israelites were the illustration of this very thing. May we be satisfied in the manna that God gives us each and every day, our daily bread. And not allow the desires of the meat, so to speak, to change our attitude and our disposition mentally and physically, spiritually and emotionally. And then, secondly, be careful how you ask for it. Now, I think, this is a, a think, this isn't a doctrinal statement, but I think that it was possible that God would not have been so angry with the people of Israel if they gave the request to God in the right manner. As it says in verse 20, there was a rejection from the Lord, or to the Lord. There was no thankfulness at the provision of the manna day after day. There was no request of the meat that if it would be according to your will, could we have a little quail? There was none of that. As we learned earlier, they were weeping outside of their tent. They were actually suggesting that they can go back to Egypt because it was better there. It's no wonder that Moses was just throwing his hands up in frustration and why God was so angry with the people of Israel. And in the end, what happens? 
The people that had that craving, the people that handled this so incorrectly, the people that that would say those things to the Lord that he repeated twice here, by the way, that they would actually want to go back to Egypt after all those things that the Lord had done, that he delivered them out of Egypt, that he parted the sea so they could go through dry land, that they would actually say, no, we actually want to swim through that Red Sea and get back there and have the fish. And it's just remarkable. But in the end, God had to punish them for their attitude, punish them for their cravings, punish them for their rejection of the Lord. I don't think it was even a meat thing at this point. It was the way they asked for it, their attitudes and their hearts, and they were struck down with a plague. Two friends met each other on a street one day. One of them looked quite sad, almost on the verge of tears. So his friend asked, what has the world done to you, my friend? The sad fellow said, well, let me tell you. Three weeks ago, my uncle died and left me $40,000. That's a lot of money, the other friend said. But you see, two weeks ago, a cousin I never even knew died, and he left me $85,000, free and clear. Friend says, sounds to me you've you've been very blessed. You don't understand, he interrupts. Last week, my great aunt passed away and I inherited a quarter of a million dollars from her. Now, the friend at this point is, is pretty confused at why this man is so sad. And he says to him, then why do you look so glum? And the friend said, well, this week, nothing. We often come to a point where we expect certain blessings from God that He has never promised us. And that's a bad place to be. Because when they do not come, what happens? You begin to complain. You get bitter. See, ungratefulness is a disease that can permeate your entire existence, it's a vicious cycle. Ungratefulness leads to complaining, which leads to God's punishment. And like we see here, the ungratefulness towards God's provision, as simple as food, it's not a happy ending. It could be anything in your life, church. It really can. Satan can get a hold of your heart about anything, complain about anything, even the silliest things to the biggest thing. Ungratefulness, it's a result of forgetting God's promises, both in the past and in the future, as we've learned today. So as we take part in the greatest act deserving of our gratefulness, the remembrance of the Savior's sacrifice, may we remember the the promise that was fulfilled on the cross, the past. And the promise of our future because of Jesus, if you follow him, our future. Let's pray. Father, we need your help. We fail often in our attitudes. There are times, Lord, where we reject the blessings that you have given us and our past, and we forget about the promises of your, the blessings of our future. We thank you, Lord, for those. We thank you for the grace that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings and forgive us for overlooking them. Lord, as we think of the day ahead, the week ahead, it can be easy to complain, so very easy, But we ask, Lord, that you would help us to look to you, to look for your grace, to uncover blessings, and to dwell in that. And Lord, the greatest blessing of all is salvation, the sacrifice of your Son on the cross. As we celebrate and remember that today, Help us not to take it for granted. 
help us to live in gratefulness to you. In Jesus' name, amen.